Welcome to Go Live TV, the future in your hands. The only multicultural IPTV station that brings communities together. Over 2.7 million people have already watched Go Live TV anytime, anywhere. We're called to plunder hell and populate heaven. This is the moment. That is a sound of revival. That is an alarm of an awakening. Hey everybody, welcome again to Go Tell All Live. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. I'm here with an amazing pastor, you know, thinker, uh, thought leader, uh, pastor, uh, Derek Schneider, thank you, sir, for being here, man. I, I, I love your ministry. Thank I love you. what God is doing in and through you. Thank you so much. It thank is you. a privilege. Thank you. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you, sir. For I just want to get right into it because there's a lot of great stuff we're going to cover today. And I just love what God is just doing with your ministry. Uh, who is Derek Snyder? Please just tell the people. <laughs> well, actually, I have a bit of background in the music industry. Believe it or not, uh, fourth generation pastor's kid on both sides, backslidden as a teenager, went into the hip-hop world. I know that might be hard to believe, but was the opener for Eminem's movie, The Eight Mile. I mean, really backslidden. Uh, if you were to turn on the radio at certain times in the city here in Toronto, you'd hear my single, different uh, songs released throughout the world. And then uh, an encounter with Jesus right before I was going to sign a four-year recording contract uh, the Lord interrupted my plans, and, uh, you know, I didn't sign the contract, and I went into a bedroom. I was staying in on vacation, and I sat down in an old rocking chair. It's a true story. Sat down in this rocking chair, and I said, God, I'm totally depressed, totally dissatisfied. I'm going to wait here in this chair until you show up. If you're interested in me, here I am. And within moments, the room was just electric with the presence of God. And he said, I have not called you to do this, but I've called you to preach. And I began ministering. That week was my first speaking engagement. <laughs> you know, when God wants to accelerate something. Uh, and I had enough background there. And I was thrust into ministry uh, at that point. Yeah. <laughs> There's somebody watching right now. You just heard that, and you're just uh, in a place uh, caught up in the uh, in the circular industry, and you know God has a call in your life. What do you have to say to that person watching right now that just heard that? Well, I, I would say that if you're called to the music industry, good. Let God use you there, but let let you be somebody that has cultivated so much of heaven within you that you determine the environment when you go into the secular industry. But if you're not called to the music industry, the most important thing is to get in touch with God in a way that you can hear clearly and distinctly, what is my purpose on earth? You know, you can be saved and there's still a sense of dissatisfaction as a Christian. I know the religious might not like this, but you can be a Christian and still be feeling somewhat dissatisfied. It's because God has hardwired us to feel that we have a purpose for being born. And our journey begins when we start to seek that out. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. I want to just uh, move forward with this, uh, with the history makers. Mm -hmm. I love how God has touched many people through that movement. Please tell us about the History Makers, how it started, and what God is doing. You know, the History Makers experience, uh, that's what we call it, has been an incredible journey. Uh, a little bit of background, I led revival in what was our home church at the time for about seven or eight years. And then the Lord removed his glory from the meetings. And now we were kind of doing church as usual. And up until that point, my box for a move of God was get as many people into the building as possible and come hear me preach and the service should go as long as possible. And uh, once the Lord removed the glory, I realized God had been showing me through revival one side of a two-sided coin. So to, to 
you know, human nature will hold on to the glory where it was. And so he pulled back on that so that I would explore. He wanted to introduce me into the other side of that coin, which was the equipping and transformation piece. And I had no idea back then that the body of Christ was about to be thrust into a global understanding of kingdom, of being equipped in purpose, calling, and destiny, and being sent. So when I did everything to try to get people to come to the church, come to the building, they weren't coming. And I said, Lord, I don't think I can pastor like this, preaching to the same people for the next 30 plus years. And God had mercy on me in directing my attention to focusing on who was in the church, don't worry about numbers, but awaken their purpose, equip them in it, and send them. And in sending them, our numbers started to grow, if you can wrap your mind around that. And so the history maker's experience was how the Lord had mercy on us. He gave us this gift, this three-day training that we really call uh, a specially choreographed spirit-filled environment designed to bring you to the end of your own abilities so that you have to tap into apostolic grace, supernatural ministry, to even complete the training. <laughs> that is loaded. You're so just, pla uh, you just plan on the church, history makers mm -hmm. church. Tell mm -hmm. us about that, please. Well, what happened was within two years of starting these trainings, we were sent to the nations. We were able to reach in just those two years, uh, just over 250,000 people. We saw far more fruit than just trying to get everybody to come to the building. So we were traveling and doing that. We didn't have a local church base, but we were equipping the church globally. So we kind of did it backwards. Rather than starting a church and then going out, uh, we started the movement. And now we've planted a local church base uh, in, in Oshawa, Ontario. And we still have our global network. We partner with other churches. We just want to serve and equip people, help pastors get set free. Because if you talk to any of them, when I travel around the world, they're saying, we know the seven mountain mandate. We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't know how. You see, the gap between what we preach and teach and the actual execution of it in society is, is great. And we want to help pastors close the gap to where they are enjoying ministry again. They're seeing results in their city. It, 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 it doesn't matter how many people you have in your church. If you can just equip a few of them properly and effectively, you can pastor your city through your members. <laughs> this is great. Do you have any practical examples from the history makers of your church of what it looks like, how God is using your church to influence society? We have, I would say, hundreds of testimonies. We feature as many as we can on the website. But one of them in particular that I like to highlight is an older gentleman by the name of Patrick Flontek, who uh, attended our church, our former church in those years, my father's church, for over 20 years and had never led a single person to Christ. He was an older man, faithful church attendance, but wasn't bringing the kingdom beyond the four walls. After he took this training, uh, he was rewired. The grace of Jesus was on him. He ended up going on to oversee two seniors churches, 40 or 50 people in senior centers, and started a program uh, called Budding with Seniors that ministers to that sphere. And he said at our, our last national conference, he said, Pastor, I'm leading people to Christ on almost a weekly basis. And they're not coming to our church, but we're going to them. And he's reaching people for Christ. And we have many testimonies like this. Uh, one woman, uh, Marguerite uh, McLeod, she came through the training and she wanted to be used in the education system. But she didn't know how to do it. And she felt like she wasn't to fight the education system, but she created a curriculum. Uh, she figured out how to do this in our training. And uh, she created this curriculum for families, not to remove their children from the school system, but how to equip their children in the secular school system. And within six months of her graduating the training, uh, her curriculum was in over 36 countries or something like that. The, the problem we have at this time is that uh, 
for people to believe the stories. We've been living so long in the realm of prayer and prophetic only, as good as those things are. When the, when the results are there, when the apostolic kingdom results are there, we have trouble believing it. <laughs> you also have a podcast, Transformation Generation. Transformation Tell Generation. us about it. Transformation Generation was just a uh, podcast through Charisma Podcast Network. You're probably familiar with Charisma. And it, for us, it was just another avenue to get this message out there. So not only are we teaching some of the things we teach in the History Makers Training, uh, but we're also wanting to interview ordinary people. I really believe, Solomon, that we're, the church is entering the era of the practitioner. Not just the theorists, not the kingdom theorists. And we've had those days, and they were great days, and they've served to teach and, and prepare the body. But now we're seeing normal people, what we would call normal people, when the kingdom gets in them, if they're properly equipped and trained, they go out and can do exploits. Uh, I want to mention to you that when the mayor of our city uh, gave our movement an award for impact in the city, uh, he thought that there were hundreds of us. At that time, we only had 13 graduates. He was shocked when he came to the event. There's only 13 of you. Ordinary individuals who have been equipped in the grace of God, they know their calling, and they're bringing transformation. So we want to feature those kind of people on the podcast, not necessarily the big names. <laughs> I've got to ask you this, speaking about the kingdom, what is the message of the kingdom? Wow. Wow. What a great question. Well, the message of the kingdom essentially is the king's domain, kingdom. And the desire of Jesus, and if it was good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for us. The desire of Jesus was that everywhere on planet earth would become the king's domain. Where the church has been caught up in almost a sort of charismatic religiosity is we're forever praying that God will come down and make our city the king's domain. If we can hold enough prayer meetings, maybe God will come down and change the city. If we can prophesy the right prophecies, if we can do the right protocols, you know, in a prayer meeting, God will come down and somehow mystically make our cities or our nation the king's domain. The problem is, well, we have been waiting on God. God has been waiting on us. He has given us the kingdom. The kingdom is transferable. <laughs> So when Jesus came, he was the entry point. He was the authority. And he says, now I give you the keys to the kingdom. So there's a transference to us. That's why he had to go. And now we go out and we are to bring the kingdom practically and tangibly to every sphere that, that we go. That's why it's almost a, a, the sin of irresponsibility to remain locked up within the four walls when we have been given a kingdom that wants to possess and occupy territory out there. This is good <laughs> stuff. Oh, are you guys taking any lessons from this? Thank you, Lord, for this. Uh, someone is watching right now. They want to get plugged into your church. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to bring the history makers to your church. How can they find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, we are, if you go to historymakersacademy.com, uh, especially go to the testimony section because you might be watching and saying, wow, this guy is saying a lot of stuff here. <laughs> go check out the testimonies, see that it's for real. And History Makers Academy, we are hosting one of our trainings, the, the one we're discussing, uh, October 28th through 30th. So that's coming up. But we also like to go into churches. And you can just reach out to us through historymakersacademy.com. Uh, Facebook, we're, we're easy to find, and we'll come into your church to serve, we'll equip your people, we'll do the heavy lifting for you, and uh, you just be open for transformation of your, of your church and your city. <laughs> just being around you, just the smell, the fragrance of Jesus all over Hallelujah. you. Hallelujah. And I have to ask you, who is Jesus to you? Mm. Jesus to me, he's my Savior because he saved me from, from something. He's my Lord, because he leads me in all things. And he is my primary ministry, to minister to him. And the byproduct of that time spent with him handles the work of the ministry. 
And I want to ask you, that was a very powerful answer, by the way. Praise God. I was going to ask you this question. I, I, I follow you on social media. You wrote something to this effect. We were never meant to live in revival. We were Ooh. meant to live in rulership. <laughs> Please take it home. What do you mean by that? Is it wrong to want to live in revival or to mm. believe for revival mm. in your church? You know, I think we have somewhat misunderstood revival. Uh, when you do a historical study on revival, we don't have time to do that today, but you'll find that revival is the exception. It comes and it goes. And I really believe that that's because God doesn't want any place to be a Mecca where we say, there is the kingdom. And we just all have to go there and there's the kingdom. God is in the business of dispersion. So revivals will have this peak and then you'll see that they'll they'll go. Revival is meant more so to wake up the believer to go and fulfill a commission. So revival is, is the means by which you get to the point. Once you're revived and you're, you're woken up, we're supposed to go and fulfill the great commission of Jesus, which is literally to disciple whole nations. So when we talk about revival, often we're looking for revival to come down and do everything for us. When God has also given us kingdom principles, and the principles of the kingdom allow you to pass from the wilderness of dependence on miracles into the promised land where the miracles don't stop, but now you're walking in principles in the promised land that you, you become a manager of your garden. You begin to do things in a way based on kingdom principles where you prosper without the need of waiting on a revival to come. Revival often, especially in Canada, I've found we, we get caught in forever waiting for something that's coming. When Jesus clearly said, do you not say there are still four more months and then the harvest? Well, I say the harvest is ripe right now. So the go of the gospel is actually a present tense reality. We, we have to go whether there's revival or not. So we're carriers of something beyond great services. And when you look at even some great revivals that have happened recently in our own generation, Brownsville Revival, Pensacola, uh, Toronto Airport Revival, right here in Toronto, uh, John Arnott will even tell you the whole world was showing up at our door. Pastors were refreshed. People were changed, but the city didn't really care about it. It hardly impacted the city around it. So revival does not necessarily transform a nation. Kingdom principles uh, infused into the culture through righteous systems are what disciple a nation. And that's a loaded statement there, but. That's a good, I want to quickly move on to the next. Uh, to, there are people watching right now and you're hearing what, Pastor Derek Schneider sharing, you're feeling a bit uh, this sense of like inspired, but you're saying, what about me? There's someone watching right now, you're, you're, you've been asking the Lord for, for direction, what is my purpose, uh, what is next? Would you please just uh, speak to the camera and just minister to the viewers right now, uh, just as the Holy Spirit leads you? Yeah, I just want to bless each person that's watching right now, and I want to tell you that there really is more. And it begins with activating the thing that God has called you to do. God has not called you to stagnation, waiting until, you know, you die and go to heaven. But he's put purpose inside of each one of you. But it needs to be unlocked. And many are sitting in church waiting for something to somehow move them, for God to come down and do what he's told you to go and do. <laughs> and I want to encourage you that it might be time to start. Pick a need and meet it. If you're not sure of your calling and purpose yet, join us at a History Makers training. Let us activate and awaken that in you so you can begin to see the reality and the traction that the kingdom of God has when it comes into a territory through you. Would you pray for the people, please? Thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless each person that's watching. I minister healing. Those of you who are sick in body, if you're watching, place your hand on yourself. We dethrone sickness right now by enthroning Jesus. Minister healing, I pray, through the gift of healing that, Holy Spirit, you have given. I also pray that you would awaken in each person a destiny moment. As they watch this, maybe, maybe a revelation hit them. I pray that you would, starting today as they watch it, some 
something would begin to change. It's time to, for change in your life. And if you're watching, just say, Lord, I'm ready for a change. Just say yes to God. If you give him your yes, your obedience, he will be sure to open certain doors and begin to give you platform as a son or a daughter in bringing the kingdom to this earth. I bless you and I say, destiny, visit them in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you Hallelujah. for that. Just receive it, my friends. Receive it in Jesus' name. Pastor Derek, uh, I'm not even sure if we're still in a pandemic, but <laughs> we just had one of the, 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 the craziest pandemic ever. Uh, so mm -hmm. many lives were lost. Yeah. Businesses were lost. People lost jobs. Uh, people were, uh, you know, lost loved ones. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, the way we do life now has changed a lot. Yes. Churches were closed during the pandemic. And then now you look at gas price, yeah. and then we look at, uh, you know, the war in Ukraine and, and, and Russia. Is there, is there a powerful lesson? Is there something the Holy Spirit has taught you during this time you want to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, firstly, you have to understand that uh, both, both the devil and God will capitalize on a crisis. <laughs> and so you'll, you'll see the devil at work, even if he's the initiator of this whole thing. But God will not miss an opportunity to get you in a boat in a storm. It's just too much of an opportunity. So what God did, what I saw him do, was an accelerated retooling of the church. There were a number of things he did. You, for the average believer, they got to see if their Christianity still works without a Sunday morning in-person gathering. For somebody else, uh, they found out, wow, I haven't spoken to my neighbors. I'm, I've got good church attendance, but I'm engaging no one in society. For other churches, they retooled and shifted to an online hybrid model where they actually reached more people than they ever had before. So if you have eyes to see the opportunity, the kingdom solution within the crisis, uh, this past season was an opportunity for you. I also saw the Lord in this past season begin to deal with some things in the charismatic world that I think he needed to. Um, some of the views that nothing bad should ever happen to, to, to any believer, that kind of a thing. Uh, we also saw... Um, the, the celebrity preacher, we saw that thing targeted. We, we have just watched over the past three years uh, the chaos in the nations, how God has literally reset the church. Uh, the, the prophetic movement was touched. You know, I won't go into too much there, we all know, but, but I feel like there was a humbling that was put upon the prophetic movement where we just had to reset and get back to the reality. Listen, the gospel of the kingdom works best where are there, there are problems. God is attracted to chaos. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have been hovering over the waters in Genesis. Don't, don't so get good. me preaching, brother. <laughs> no, this, this is really good. This is good stuff. I hope you guys are taking notes. And I want to encourage you viewers, watch this live program over and over and over again. <laughs> Until it sinks in. Mm. You know, we're approaching the end of this, in, this amazing interview. We can go for hours. Yeah, I think now, so. Th there, there are two names I want to bring up. I just mm. want to ask you to just uh, share with, with us uh, what comes to your mind when you think about these names. Uh, the first name would be uh, your, uh, your father, uh, mm. Doug Schneider, who was a general in the faith. Yes. Impacted so many yes. uh, thousands in, in this beautiful in the nation of Canada and globally, too. Uh, what comes to your mind uh, when you think of him and what lessons did you learn that really marked you? You know, watching dad die this past December of brain cancer was something that we never dreamed could be possible for a man that was so alive. And as he was passing away, there were things that went on with the church that was part, is part of a denomination. And he was put to a place where all he really had left as he laid in that hospital bed was the reports of individuals, the messages, the emails, the text messages of individuals that were impacted by his life along the way. And as I would read these, there were literally several hundred of them, each with their individual story of what 
how God had used dad in their life. Dad was somebody who stopped for the one. He loved the one. And at the end of his life, I realized, oh my gosh, his legacy is not in that big building he built that someone else came and took. Uh, his legacy is not even in a particular church or title or denominational influence, but his legacy, the word is legacy to answer your question, his legacy is in the ones that he loved one by one by one. And they accumulate at the end of your life, and as you pass into heaven, you have to answer the question, did I learn to love? Did you learn to love is what God is going to ask. And so I realized, oh my gosh, the vehicle, the denomination, the title, the platform, the whatever, were really just vehicles God used to teach him how to love one person at a time. We had a single mom saying, your dad was the only one that welcomed me. When I got pregnant out of wedlock, he welcomed me still into the church. And they each had their story. And I realized, you know what? I want to leave a legacy of love. And I've, I've begun to make some changes, radical changes in my ministry, radical changes in, in a conversation with somebody. When I die... Will people have been impacted? Because that's all you have are the ones that you loved along the way. Wow. Thank you for that's sharing. That's Doug Schneider right there. Thank you. Wow. What, a, what, a, what an impact he had in, in, in the nation. And my next, uh, the next name I want to bring up is uh, Sunday at Elijah. Mm. When you think of him, what lessons have you learned or been around him mm. or seen what God is doing in Ukraine? Because it's a sensitive time right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, especially in Ukraine, the war that was going on. War is never the solution, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, just uh, b having a close uh, relationship with him. And what, I know you've preached in Ukraine before. Yes, many times. You've been there. Maybe many share times. a little bit about, the, we have three minutes left, a mm -hmm. little bit about your experience there and mm -hmm. some lessons you learned from uh, Pastor Sunday. Well, Pastor Sunday, I didn't mean to meet him. We met at a conference. He laid hands on me. I received genuine impartation, went home, and that's when the revival started. So I kept in touch with this laughing, wild Nigerian pastor. And it, before long, I was flying back and forth, experiencing what was then the the largest church in Europe at that time was that church. They were turning the society upside down, incredible influence. And I was flying back and forth and just learning lessons and, and receiving uh, mentorship from him. When I think of Dr. Sunday, though, I, I think of somebody also who uh, was able to break the back of culture and the back of all kinds of things that would hinder a Nigerian man and a 99% white Caucasian congregation because he loved the least. To make a long story short, the Lord spoke to him to go straight to the poor. One drug addict got saved. She helped him to lead other drug addicts to the Lord. Those drug addicts had family who were normal, healthy, and they all wanted to come to this church. They said, we don't care what color this man is in Ukraine. All I know is my son, the Orthodox Church, couldn't deliver him. The government systems couldn't deliver him. He got delivered in this church, so they all started coming. And that's what produced the mega church, loving one person at a time. This is, this is the key. So that is a bit of the heritage and spiritual DNA uh, I come from. Praise God. That's so good. We've got about uh, about less than, uh, about a minute left. I want to just ask you. I, I think of you as a general in the faith, uh, an Thank ambassador, you, a champion. Mm -hmm. God is championing so many great things in and through your life. An amazing husband, a father. Uh, I honor you, man. Uh, Thank you. You know, just uh, hearing how God pulled you from where you were in, the, in just in one minute. Uh, what is burdening your heart right now for the church? Mm. You're, there will be pastors watching this live, and and leaders, and friends, and what encouragement from your heart do you feel the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart to share with us today? You know, we get so busy building our own kingdoms, and we don't know where our motivation really is unless the Lord does something drastic. I would say to pastors and leaders today that to not put your focus on how many people you have in your building, uh, because you can have... Uh, 
a mega church, but the society is not transformed. And I can show you nations where there's a church on every corner, but the society is not transformed. I would encourage pastors to begin to shift your focus to how you can serve your, your congregation, how you can equip them, how you can release them into society, and you will find something great will happen. When I released our first disciple into her calling out there, she ended up bringing eight back into the church, and I said, now there's a good church growth system. I sowed one. I got 10 back. And when you shift your approach to beyond the four walls ministry, instead of building your own kingdom, building his kingdom out there, whether they ever come to your church or not, that shift in perspective, God will empower. He will bless it. He will use you. He will raise you up to do things you never dreamed of if you make it about his kingdom. He said he will build his church. <laughs> Leave his church alone. You build the kingdom and watch what God does for your church. Amen. Thank you, Derek Schneider. God bless you, sir. Thank you for your Such time here. Such an honor. You know, sir. This, is, uh, this is powerful. I want to encourage you. Watch this over again. Father, bless you for your strength in him and give them understanding from this life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. This is our life. 